gentlemen, I think uh, we're about complete now. Um, I'm Marcus Karna. Uh, I hail from Singapore Management University, and that uh, already introduces a little shift in emphasis now. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, the talk by Brian Arthur, uh, who will talk about uh, the economy as a complex evolving system. Now, uh, Brian Arthur is uh, one of those uh, legendary pioneers in complex system studies. Uh, he was a founding member of the Santa Fe Institute for uh, Complex Studies in New Mexico. Uh, originally, he was at uh, Stanford, and he's now at uh, the Park Intelligent uh, Systems Lab, the Xerox Park Lab, famous lab in Palo Alto. Now, uh, just to give you a sort of a brief overview on the reach and depth of Brian's research and how it has influenced uh, the field, um, in two classes that I teach, not one, but in two classes that I teach, I use his concepts, and it's things that are in undergrad textbooks now, uh, things like um, uh, recombination in technology or combination of various elements, uh, things like positive returns and path dependency in the economy, uh, dominant designs, lock-in of designs, uh, not to mention also <laughs> autonomous agents as a major factor in the economy rather than sort of general equilibria. So all of these things that are now in undergrad textbooks have actually been pioneered by Brian. So this is really a quite an amazing feat. Now, um, one thing I didn't actually know until I met him first, uh, first time last year was how uh, controversial that research originally was when it was presented in the late 80s and 90s, that it wasn't actually obvious. When I encountered it in the mid 90s as, as a uh, postdoc, basically, um, I thought this was sort of, you know, really a gift from heaven, something that is, uh, widely accepted. I didn't actually realize that it wasn't widely accepted originally. So um, maybe one, one thing that really opened my personal eyes was the famous El Foral paper, which was, I don't know if uh, many of you know that, it's a paper on how people decide whether they should or should not go to a specific bar in Santa Fe. And the idea is that they basically uh, judge based on their expectation on how many people are going to be there next week is based on how many people there were there last week. So it works with expectations and hindsight, and it produces this irregular pattern of people who either go and do, or, or who don't. And that is a very nice example of how, uh, if in, in this case, uh, attendance at this bar, or you could extrapolate to markets, how uh, systems can be uh, irrational even if all participants behave rationally, because people do behave rationally in their indiv individual decisions. So actually that's a nice example of how individuals do matter in their opinions. So, uh, now of course I did actually meet Brian in Singapore, which is uh, a bit ironic because for many years he worked in Vienna, Austria, where I'm from originally, but I didn't meet him there, I met him here. So maybe that is a sign of things to come where complexity community actually comes together in Singapore thanks to the <coughs> program that has been now uh, uh, inaugurated. So without further ado, please um, uh, welcome Brian Arthur. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. And I'm amazed and thrilled that so many people are still here after three days. <laughs> it says a lot about the program, Jan. I think the talks have been terrific up until now. And I must say I'm very glad to be in Singapore. Um, the only footnote I'd add to El Farol is that every time I walk into the El Farol bar, now they give me free beer because <laughs> <laughs> they have made an awful lot of money out of physicists visiting Santa Fe <laughs> and <laughs> asking, where's the El Farol bar? <laughs> At any rate, um, what I want to talk about um, is economics uh, today, and um, as Marcus said, the economy is an evolving complex system. And this is work, actually, that goes back to the very start of the Santa Fe Institute. But it's also work that uh, produced this book called The Nature of Technology that I put out about two years ago. <clears throat> so let me start at the beginning. There are, as I see it, there's, there are two great 
problems or theoretical themes, if you like, in economics. Uh, one is how resources are allocated within markets, and the other is how the economy evolves or develops or how it arises in the first place. And these are themes that have been there for the last 230, 240 years, as long as there's been a formal study of economics. That first problem is, given that markets exist and that there's certain possibilities of, of different firms producing, different consumers consuming what they produce, what sort of pattern do we see of goods being produced and consumed and at what prices? And that's usually taken to be at equilibrium so that you can solve the resulting equations. And variations on that theme have given us the theory of international trade, you know, what countries produce what and what patterns result. It's, it's given us the theory of equity markets or asset pricing, theories of the stock market, if you like, theories of finance, uh, general equilibrium theory, theories that have guided policy over the last 100 or 150 years or more. So this is a major achievement in economics, uh, these allocation problems. I'm talking theoretical economics here. The other problem is a more basic problem. It's basically, where does an economy come from? And that's the one I want to talk about today. How do you get an economy in the first place? Once you have an economy, how does it unfold or develop? How does it evolve? Uh, how does it change structurally? How does it form and reform? One of the most striking things about any economy, if you start to read economic history, or if you just go to places, I went to India in 1975. Going there now, India's very different, and that's even in my lifetime. So economies are changing. Their structures are constantly changing. They're evolving. So this would be, the first problem would be in biology <clears throat> or in the biosphere saying if you had a fixed number of species all interacting in a, some sort of given setup, what numbers of species would you see at equilibrium? How would that work out, et cetera? The second problem would say how do the species form in the first place? How do they get there? How does the whole biosphere form? Both these problems are difficult. They've both taken decades to look at, and I will say more as we go along. The one thing I want to point out is that at least for the first 100 years of economics, since about 1776, for about 100 years, the main uh, thinkers in economics thought about both problems, how the economy arose and changed, and how this patterns were formed and prices formed and allocation took place. Uh, at the top as well, in the middle, of course, is Adam Smith, uh, J.S. Mill, uh, Malthus and Ricardo, and our good friend uh, Karl Marx. What they did, some people, might, if you're educated in mathematics as I was, or in physics, you might say, well, it's not really theoretical. Uh, at least up until about 1870, it was based on words. But I would claim it's based on deep insight. And I don't think we've got an awful lot farther beyond the insight of people like Ricardo, or indeed Marx, or J.S. Mill, or Smith himself. What we've done so far in the intervening period is to mathematize a lot of this. At any rate, the insights were deep. The insights were brilliant. Theory was articulated in this period up until about 1870. I'm not saying theory stopped, but something then peculiar happened around 1870. There's a different cast of characters here. Um, in the middle there is Stanley Jevons. Uh, you mightn't recognize these faces quite as easily. That's Karl Menger. Menger uh, was also from Austria, uh, the father of the great mathematician, also Karl Menger. Uh, the man on the top right is Alfred Marshall, who's English. And the dapper-looking one, uh, 
with the beard is Léon Wavra, Wavra, who's French and then worked in um, Switzerland. What these people discovered was that they could mathematize part of economics. They could take the allocation problem, what patterns of production and consumption, at what prices do we see? And they could make that mathematical. Turns out that Marshall was trained in physics at Cambridge. He was second wrangler, meaning he, he nearly got the top place. The top place went to, I think it was 1866, uh, to Lord Raleigh, who became a pretty decent physicist. But uh, these people are training in physics. Um, while I was trained as an engineer, which might cheer you up here at NTU, uh, Jevons as a botanist and mathematician. Menger was actually trained as an economist, but survived and went on to do very good mathematical work. So we had 1870, this comes along. The first of these two grand themes, the allocation problem, gets mathematized. It actually gets physicized because they were able to lift great swatches of material in the 1880s from statistical mechanics and other parts of physics and then apply those to economics. And the entire history of theory in the 20th century, or almost the entire history of the 20th century, is the history of making their insights more rigorous and more rigorous and more mathematized and yet more mathematized and ever more rigorous. And <clears throat> to the degree that economics came to be defined as allocation theory. And if you look up a definition of the economy in any economics textbook or even in a dictionary, it will tell you it's about the allocation of goods and services within markets. An economy is a set of markets in which goods and services are allocated. This came to be all of economics, or nearly all of economics. They, a metaphor for this is that what they thought about and produced was, to my mind, a wonderful machine. Other economists have seen it this way as well. But the machine is elegant, it's perfect, Everything's humming along in equilibrium. There are theorems about exactly how it all works. And there's theorems about the perfection under this, that, and the other set of conditions. The outcome is in some way optimal. <clears throat> People tend to forget all the detailed conditions, by the way, and just assume it's optimal. Um, it, those conditions might occupy three or four pages, and they're never true, but... Uh, <laughs> In the US, this is where that's forgotten. So we're back at this problem then. How does the economy form and reform? And it's not so much that this was forgotten. It was eclipsed during the 20th century. All except for the work of one person here. If I can, uh, that's uh, Josef Schumpeter. Let me go back to this for a moment. The reason that standard allocation theory can't talk about this problem of where an economy comes from is that allocation theory, all of this beautiful mathematical work, is done at equilibrium, meaning that everything is constant through time. And you can't have an equilibrium theory that talks about creation. And so the various attempts to use that standard economic equilibrium theory to talk about structural change, to my mind, haven't been very satisfactory at all. And I think most economists would certainly agree with that. What you can do is to say, well, new technology has come along. So we'll go back to the machine. We will slot in a new component. Then a new equilibrium is formed. Or we can say that gradually something changes in the machine, and you get growth theory. The equilibrium tracks something and changes. We can have endogenous growth theory, but none of it really tells us how the structure of an economy arises in the first place, where the whole thing comes from, 
and how economies change in character and change structurally over time. And again, for this reason, you can't get creation out of equilibrium. My good colleague at Santa Fe, John Holland, used to, we would, we would talk about equilibrium, and John would just stop us in our tracks and say, uh, do you realize that an e equilibrium is another definition of death? Nothing happens at equilibrium. And <laughs> anyway, it's kind of like Princeton on a Saturday night. If you've ever <laughs> anyway, nothing happens. <laughs> so all of this was greatly neglected during the 20th century, and all except for this one man, uh, who's a hero of mine, and that is Josef Schumpeter. I should hasten to say I'm not putting down allocation economics. It's highly mathematical. I did my time. I published the papers in it. And uh, I've been there, and many of my colleagues. I have great respect for what has been done. What I'm saying is that the balance has been really one-sided. And I took a graduate education, certainly up to doctoral level at UC Berkeley. And this man's name was never mentioned, not once. I had never heard of Schumpeter by the time I finished. I finished. Uh, my PhD is in a branch of mathematics, but this man, I never heard of, Josef Schumpeter. You probably have heard of him as um, the one thing Schumpeter claimed, again, from originally from Vienna and worked in Graz. Uh, Schumpeter, as a young man, was very ambitious, and I'm sure most of you know the story that he's, he said his ambition was to be the greatest economist in the world, the greatest horseman in Austria, and the greatest lover in Vienna. <laughs> and I'd heard of this. Everybody in economics knows this. And I had heard that he had, on his deathbed, he'd said, he, to his disappointment, he'd only accomplished two of the three. So I cornered Richard Swedberg, who's his biographer. You, you might know Richard uh, Swedberg. Uh, Schumpeter's biographer, and I said, uh, which one didn't he accomplish? Swedberg said, oh, he said, he admitted he wasn't the best horseman in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a, I have a, along these lines, now imagine Schumpeter, he's incredibly ambitious, he's 25, he's infatuated with equilibrium allocation theory, he writes this tome on it in German, it's a pretty good book, or a very, very good book. He sends the book to his hero, Walra. That's the dapper guy up in the top left. And Walra's in Switzerland in Lausanne. And Schumpeter follows the book a few weeks later, goes to visit Walra, knocks his door. And Walra's getting a little old by now. Schumpeter's about 25, 26. And Schumpeter is on the doorstep, and he says, uh, uh, I am the person who sent you the book on equilibrium theory. And Val Ra says, oh, that was a wonderful book that your father produced. Uh, do come in, Schumpeter said. No, that was my book. I, I wrote the book. Your, that was a beautiful book of your father. <laughs> so he brings him in for tea. Schumpeter convinces him somehow that Schumpeter actually wrote the book, not his dad. While Ra sees him to the door and then shakes his hand and says, and give my compliments to your father for his beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Schumpeter goes back to Vienna, actually, I'm sure, to Graz by then. And that's him finished with general equilibrium <laughs> theory the rest of his life. Exactly 100 years ago, uh, 1911, 1912, he writes a book called The Theory of Economic Development and takes on this problem, where on earth does an economy come from? When I write development here, I'm using Schumpeter's word. I guess it was Entwicklung. Um, where does an economy actually come from? So we're not talking about development in the sense of how does Malaysia or Singapore develop, or how does, how does England develop in the 1800s? I'm talking about where does an economy arise from 
How does it change structurally? How, in other words, does it form and reform? This is actually, there's a hint here because you think, no, I didn't think this way. A lot of this argument I'm giving you is in retrospect, after I had done a lot of thinking. But if you do think about it, you think there is one area that might have something to say about this. Not equilibrium mathematics, not differential topology. There is one subject matter that might have something to say about this problem, and that is complexity theory. Complexity is about emergence, it's about formation, it's about changes in pattern, it's about phase changes from one regime to another, and above all, it's about the propagation of change. As we heard in some of these lectures earlier, uh, the very beautiful one um, given by Laszlo Barabasi, uh, it's about the formation of networks. So you might stand here, and again, this is sort of a buh afterwards of thinking about this problem for a decade or more. Surely complexity would have something to say about all of this. Complexity is about formation. And I've come to the conclusion, ex post facto, the answer is yes. But I wish I'd known that, Jeff, when I was at the Santa Fe Institute. So I want to start in a very peculiar place. And this is our dear friend, Francois Jacob, the French molecular biologist. And from an essay he wrote, I think it was the evolution of tinkering bricolage in the 1970s. But I want to read this quote. In our universe, matter is arranged in a hierarchy of structures by successive integrations. Whether inanimate or living, the objects found on Earth are always organizations or systems. Each system at a given level uses as its ingredients some systems from the simpler level. So everything is building out of elements or building blocks that were there before. Those become building blocks for yet further integrations. The great diversity of vertebrates uh, results from the differences in the arrangement and the numbers and distribution of these few building blocks. Um, if he was writing that nowadays, that last sentence, I think, would be changed, and he'd be saying the great diversity of vertebrates results from differential programming or expression of the same 20 to 25,000 genes that mice and elephants and humans pretty much have in common. But it's very much the same sort of idea. So thinking about this, there's a story that is told in this new area of big history, but it's cosmological and runs something like this. Start wherever you like in cosmology. In the beginning, there are certain elementary particles, quarks, if you want to start there. In certain combinations, those quarks come together and form, start to form things like protons, neutrons, some of the other elementary particles. Those in combination form atomic nuclei. Those in combination with electrons form simple atoms of hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium condense, and they form, in combination, stars. The stars go through their cycles and explode. That forms, in combination, further heavier atoms, which, in combination, also coalesce and give us planets. And in further combination, and I'll march forward much more quickly, we get the organic chemistries building from combinations. We get metabolic pathways building. So that's proteins and enzymes. And those chemical reactions and chemical reactors building. We get simple bacteria, as we heard about this morning. And we get um, from combinations of parts of bacteria, we get the simplest 
eukaryotic, of eukaryotic cells. We're now into territory that's called, it's called um, tra great transformations in biology that John Maynard Smith wrote about. From there, we get multicellular organisms and so on. Notice all of this is pure Francois Jacob. Integration of building blocks giving you new elements that are further integrated in a massive hierarchy. And that's what we are sitting here today. Um, to quote um, uh, 19, what is this 1969 song? Uh, we are stardust, we are, we are gold, and we are billion year old carbon. But it's all about combination. What does that have to do with complexity? Well, these are systems that are constantly creating new elements or new building blocks out of existing ones, new structures by integration of previous ones. Again, Jacob's uh, original insight. I learned this uh, not from him, but largely from John Holland, who was always talking about the integration of building blocks and combination. And the one thing I would say is that uh, We've neglected this sort of system building to quite a degree in complexity. An awful lot of complexity work has been about existing building blocks. Think of cellular automata. And when you put those together, you constantly get new patterns. It's like the beads in the kaleidoscope are always the same beads. You turn the kaleidoscope, you get new patterns, new patterns, new patterns. We have done some work at Santa Fe, though, on the buildup of such systems, and I'm thinking of the work done by Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz as to where these organic chemistries came from in the first place, how life built up this way. So there has been some work done on this. I would love to see a bit more. Very good. Well, how does all this relate <laughs> to where the economy came from? This is a kind of template for us, at least. And I don't think it directly inspired me to think about this, but having been so many years at Santa Fe, this was deeply in our bones, the way of thinking about it. So let me uh, give an argument, and I'm going to give it in three stages about the economy. The first thing I want to say is that an economy basically forms from its arrangements or its technologies. Sander Vanderloo uh, the other day told us, uh, I think it was absolutely brilliant, he says, what we are good at as human beings is organization. So let me repeat that. What we are really good at as human beings is arranging things, is organizing things. It's putting things together and making them work. Now, I was taught that an economy, again, I'm going back to Berkeley, that an economy was basically a container for its technologies. So an economy sits there. Every so often, somebody has a bright idea. When I studied economics, where, where technologies came from wasn't well known. <clears throat> and there were models. That, they didn't come from storks landing on your chimney. But there are actually models that say, assume helicopters drop blueprints of new technology every so often. I am not kidding you, as uh, certain economic models said. But notice the economy exists, and then technologies miraculously drop into it. There's a container, and new technologies come along. I think that is deeply unsatisfactory. It's a bit like saying an ecosystem exists. There might be no species in it yet, but it exists. And we drop species from heaven or from helicopters uh, down into that ecosystem. And then the ecosystem gets busy interacting and so on. No ecosystem exists if no species are in it, full stop. No economy exists if there's no arrangements or technology. So I want to give a, a different version. And here's my definition of an economy. An economy is a set of arrangements and activities by which society fulfills its needs. Actually, I thought this felt right to me when I started to think about it this way. And that I thought that 
this is brilliant, I'm incredibly smart, this is amazing. And then I went back and I thought, there's nothing new about this. This is the way Karl Marx or Adam Smith or the classical economists thought about an economy in the first place. Marx wouldn't have used the word arrangements, but they basically saw an economy as forming from its means of production. Marx would have said instruments of production, meaning the big factories, the textile mills, the technologies of the day. <clears throat> if you go back and read those economists, and I've gone back to read what Marx said about technology, he knew technology. He was describing technologies right down to the last bobbin in these textile machines. It was amazing stuff. You could tell he was actually familiar with technologies. And for him and for the classical economists in general, an economy grew out of its technologies. It grew out of its arrangements. And it's not just its arrangements, it's the activities as well. People have to use the factories and use those means of production. What I want to do is to greatly extend beyond the classical economists and say that these arrangements or technologies include many things. They include devices, GPS systems, if you like, methods. That, that could be uh, medical procedures, even appendectomies, <laughs> industrial processes. Uh, trading systems, markets, distribution systems, banking systems, uh, central banks, uh, regulatory systems. Look at all the systems in this. Legal systems, organizations, businesses. All of those are arrangements. They're all means to a purpose. They are all technologies if we widen our thinking about what really is a technology. And together with their use and in whatever patterns they interact, they are the economy. So it's a bit like saying an ecosystem, an, an ecosystem consists of the species in it. We don't know how many species or how many are in each species, but it consists of the species and their interactions and their activities. <clears throat> so what I want to do then is to take this particular whoop, this particular insight that an economy is basically forms from the arrangements we make or the things we organize or the technologies, call them what you will, and grows up around those. Well, then we have to say where the technologies come from. So the next part of the argument is that technologies in general form a vast chemistry, meaning they're put together from simpler technologies and become building blocks for yet further technologies. So let me explain what I mean by that. If you look at any, if you look at the way engineers think, here's what you find. Uh, this isn't a map of engineers' brains. I don't know if TC would, would agree with this. But if you open the brains of engineers, and there's plenty here on this campus, and I'm trained as an engineer, uh, they, they tend to think modularly. They think in terms of functionalities. And if this were computer programmers, be thinking in terms of functions, or in terms of objects that do things, call them what you want, procedures, subroutines, and so on. Engineers are no different. This is actually a sketch of a radar system in uh, 1939, 1940. And I can recognize little bits of it, intermediate frequency radio part. There's a detector up there. There's pulse shapers and so on. Here's a cleaner way to look at much the same thing. This is radar. Now, again, this is an early system. But what I want you to notice is that that technology around about when it was invented from the mid-30s to about 1945, that period, it's put together from other technologies that already exist. Basically, you in this master oscillator, you get uh, very, very high frequency radio waves. 
Uh, you send them out somewhere, they bounce off an aircraft, they're distorted by metal, so to speak, or perturbed. You pick up the echo of that perturbation coming back, and you run it through signal processors and then show it on a cathode ray tube. That's all there is to radar. But notice, and this is what I want you to notice, that radar isn't the creation of somebody who is a genius, where it just comes out of your brain. It's the creation of people who knew an awful lot about radio frequency engineering or radio engineering. They knew all these parts, and they put together these parts, and all of these existed, and I should say all except one, the duplexer didn't exist when radar was first invented. The duplexer is there because if you put out a, a high-frequency radio signal, you want to bounce it off an aircraft, you're not going to hear that faint echo from the aircraft if you're still sending out the radio signal. So you've got to switch it off, and you have to switch it off almost at the frequency of light traveling so that you can hear the echo. It's a bit as if you continue shouting at a nearby mountain, you can't hear the echo easily. You have to stop shouting, and you have to cut it off before the echo will come back to you, or you won't hear anything. But a duplexer was put together from parts that already exist. So the point I'm making here is that all new technologies, radically new technologies, are combinations of ones that already exist. There are no exceptions to the rule, whatever. If anyone wants to challenge me, I'll probably be able to tell you how they were put together from things that, were, that already did exist. They have to be for a certain reason. If you want to compose something new, you need to put it together from things that are there already. So it's almost a truism. This was actually, this idea isn't that new either. Schumpeter foresaw this. He didn't articulate it. It's in a paragraph or two, but he definitely did see this sort of thing. And I don't want to say combination is exactly what engineers do. They certainly don't throw up modules or technologies up in the air and see where they land. They don't do that. What they do is they're trying to fulfill some purpose. And if I gave you a problem, say, you're, you're a high-powered lawyer, and I say, put together a legal brief. These two companies are, are, want to merge. We need to argue that in front of a judge. Put together a legal brief that will create the argument. Notice what is happening in a case like that is indeed combination, but we're rarely conscious of that. So a lawyer might sit down and say, well, I think I could use an argument from that case three years ago on one from the whatever, Jarndyce versus Jarndyce uh, 23 years ago, and some other arguments that I can bring in. Then we can bring the following evidence and so on. We will create something. It happens to be a combination. But just like lawyers, engineers, and ordinary people, they're not aware that they're combining anything. Everything I'm doing here in giving you an argument, I'm combining words and phrases in the English language. I'm combining ideas that are already out there. And I'm making something new. We do this all the time when we're not aware that we're combining. So I'm not saying that engineers sit there and say, how can I solve this with what combination? But that's what it amounts to. And that has an implication. That is that novel technologies are constructed from existing ones. And actually, I was well into this sort of thinking. I realized, in fact, I gave a seminar in Vienna about it. And somebody said, well, hang on, that can't be true. If that were true, then magnetic resonance imaging machines or GPS would be made out of deer's antlers or bow drills or whatever we had 10,000 years ago. So, uh, or a napped flint or something like that. And uh, those original Ur technologies, we would be combining those to this day, and we're not quite doing that. What we have done along the way is that we have used technologies to uncover 
novel phenomena. Things like the optical phenomena, the electromechanical phenomena in the 1800s, the chemical ones in the 1700s and 1800s, the electronic phenomena in the 1900s, and so on. So it's better to say they're constructed from existing technologies and from capturing phenomena using existing technologies as well. And that is an implication. Those building blocks or those new technologies offer themselves as components for the construction of yet more technologies. Once you get GPS, you can use GPS navigation. Once you get the steam engine, you can put that together with vehicles and you can get the railway locomotive. Once you get the railway locomotive, you can put that together hauling carriages and you get trains, once you, et cetera, et cetera. And so in some sense, you could create an entire family tree out of making technologies. So what I'm saying is technology is like a vast chemistry. There are certain elements. We keep discovering new elements as we capture novel phenomena. But all of technology, if we take it together, is self-creating. And the word that Maturana and Francisco Varela, Umberto Maturana and Varela, uh, Chilean uh, scientists, and really uh, great scientists, came up with this autopoietic, not autopoietic, autopoietic meaning self-creating. Technology creates itself out of itself. Now, I've said that at a few conferences, and immediately people say, well, uh, that's frightening. <laughs> no, <laughs> it does this just like a coral reef is created from small organisms, polyps, and human beings are people doing the actual creating. But if you bracket the human activities, basically technologies are created out of what already exists. New elements build out from existing ones and complication builds from simplicity. I want to make a couple of comments on that, and that is that this is pretty much foreseen by a guy, a guy called William Fielding Ogburn in 1922. I discovered this late in the game, but I really love it. So I'll read you this. It would seem that the larger the equipment of material culture, he was interested, he's a sociologist, he's interested in why uh, the U.S. society is highly developed and not, say, the Trobriand Island society of his day. What's the difference? And so he's interested in what he calls the uh, equipment of material culture. For that, read technology. The larger the equipment of material culture, the greater the number of inventions. The more Lego building blocks you have, the more you have to invent with. When the existing material culture is small, embracing a stone technique and a knowledge of skins and some woodwork, the number of inventions is more limited than when the culture consists of the knowledge of a variety of metals and chemicals and the use of steam, electricity, and various mechanical principles. The streetcar could not have been invented from the material culture existing at the last glacial period. So this is, we're very much into Sander van der Lue territory, uh, but this, I think, dovetails, unless Sander heavily disagrees, with his view of the world. Sander kind of stopped, as far as I'm concerned, around maybe a thousand years ago, but all of this has built itself out of itself. Here's just another side. Uh, how many combinations can you get very quickly? Ogburn actually thought that technologies this way grew exponentially. The more building blocks you have, the more novel combinations you can create. Uh, I did it, I, I'm a little short of time, so I'll just go through this very quickly. If you have technologies A, B, C, and D, and E, you can make all those types of combinations. In fact, you can keep repeating technologies. If you have just one thing, like, um, transistor, an MOS type gate, you can repeat that in various combinations and make all sorts of new circuits. But if you want to be conservative, you could just say if we have end technologies, we will just look at the combinations that either contain 
a given technology or it's absent. And that's quite conservative because that's not allowing for different architectures, different repeating elements and so on. If you do the math on that, it's pretty simple. But what I want to point out is that if you have 10 building blocks in your Lego set, how many combinations can you make out of that? Well, using my formula, I calculated about 1,000. For 20, it's a million. For 30, it's a billion. Sorry. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, for 20, it's a million. And then it's a billion. For 40, it's a trillion. For 50, it's a quadrillion, et cetera. I don't know what's past a quadrillion. But it gets very large very rapidly. And one thing that certainly is in my mind when I think about the number of technologies out there, I think there's probably very few. That was my own bias. I sort of think, how many medical procedures might there be? You know, well, maybe 30 or 40. But then I thought, well, I'm just ignorant in that area. So let's assume there's 225. And that probably takes into account that I don't know much beyond you know, the simpler procedures. There aren't 225. There are 64,000 or more different medical procedures that are recognized as very different. Some of those become building blocks for yet further procedures. So this is, uh, there's an awful lot of technologies out there. They're not equally fecund. If we have some sort of sodium carbonate reaction, what is that, the Solvay process? Sodium bicarbonate, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's not giving birth to very much, whereas if you have the laser or simple transistors, they're having lots of progeny. The last thing I want to do, just talking about technology here, is uh, again, now you're, let's say, I'm Bayer Bassi. I'm saying what's building out is uh, we could have then an ancestral family tree of what technology has made what one's directly possible. Well, this isn't that perfect family tree because nobody has got the data and created it just yet. So I borrowed one. This is uh, metabolic pathways. And, but it's a similar type of setup because you're asking what chemical reactions catalyze other chemical reactions. What chemical reactions make chemical reactions possible? So the kind of family tree would be a bit like this, only far bigger, far denser, and moving through time. We still have one other job to do, and that is how does the economy get created out of all of this? So what I've said so far is that if you're trying to figure out where an economy comes from, look to arrangements and technologies. Those grow and build out of building blocks that themselves are arrangements and technologies, and the whole thing is self-producing and self-creating. Now, I haven't quite said where an economy fits in, but I just want to point out that the economy obviously builds out as its technologies build out. An economy is basically the overall organization. Nobody's organizing it in most countries. And uh, I was very pleased to hear um, Brenner uh, talk about this yesterday. The economy in many countries is relatively self-organizing. We can control it here and there. But even in Singapore, which is quite a top-down economy, the economy is there, and uh, people can influence it pretty heavily if they want, but it's largely self-creating. And largely the result of its technologies. You can throw in act the activities. You could throw in the beliefs and expectations people have. But it's a bit, a bit like saying that a human being, their shape is largely the result of their skeletal structure. That's the technologies. The flows are like the blood flows. And the activities are like the motion and neural system. All of that is present. But the structure is 
largely laid out by the skeleton. Those are the technologies. But the economy, the existing ecosystem that we call the economy, is also the gatekeeper for what new technologies can be admitted. And it also, the economy is presenting the needs that bring in yet further technologies. Once we have the ability to diagnose diabetes or tuberculosis, for that matter, we experience a need as a society to cure or at least have some therapy for tuberculosis or, di or diabetes. So the, the technologies themselves create needs. Once we have cars that run on petrol or gasoline, we have a need somehow to have oil refineries that produce gasoline and for exploration activities that produce the crude oil that you can turn into gasoline. So an economy then is something that presents needs, and those needs depend very critically on the technologies that are out there. Uh, you can think of them as opportunity niches, and they're filled by different technologies. And those technologies sometimes are rendered obsolete. So back to Sander territory here. <laughs> this is <laughs> I threw this in because he's here. Uh, so you could tell a Genesis story in the beginning. If you don't mind, uh, Steve Lansing uh, had a movie. I have I've no movie, but I'll read you a passage or two out of my book. Uh, you can tell a sort of Genesis story. In the beginning, the first phenomena to be harnessed were available directly in nature. Certain materials flake when chipped, whence bladed tools. Heavy objects crush materials from pounded against hard surfaces, whence the grinding of herbs and seeds. These phenomena lying on the floor of nature, as it were, made possible primitive tools and techniques. These, in turn, made possible yet others. Fire made possible cooking, the firing of pottery, and it opened up other phenomena that when certain ores, that certain ores yield formable materials under high heat, whence weapons, chisels, hoes, and nails, combinations of elements began to occur. Uh, cords of braided fibers were used to haft metal to wood for axes. Cl clusters of technology and crafts of practice, dyeing, potting, weaving, mining, metalsmithing, boat building began to emerge. Wind and water energy were harnessed for power. Combinations of levers, pulleys, cranks, ropes, and tooth gears appeared, and so on. So now we're up to somewhere like this, Middle Ages. Crafts of practice grew around these technologies. In time, these understandings gave way to close observation of phenomena, and the use of these became systematized as the method of science. The chemical, optical, thermodynamic, and electrical phenomena began to be captured using instruments. The large domains of technology came online. Heat engines, industrial chemistry, electricity, electronics, and these still finer phenomena were captured. X radiation, radio wave transmission, coherent light. And with laser opti um, optics, radio transmission, and logic circuits, and a vast array of different combinations, modern telecommunications and computation were born. In this way, the few became many, and the many became specialized, and the specialized uncovered still further phenomena and made possible the finer and finer use of nature's principles. That's kind of my genesis. That's genesis uh, <laughs> in about three paragraphs. And we finish up with uh, something like this. But to get from, I think it's a miracle to get from here to here. And as Sander pointed out, we did it in about 30,000 years, perhaps a little less. I find that miraculous. And any working technology I want to point out, and this goes to Martin's concert last night, is not just an 
orchestration of different components, but because each component must be using at least one phenomenon to work with, it's an orchestration of different phenomena in use. If I'm sitting on board an aircraft, I'm aware that the engines and the fuselage and the empennage, the wings, are all orchestrating or creating a symphony of natural phenomena that are in use, shunting out and bringing in novel phenomena in a whole symphony. And if something didn't work or there's a discord, we might be in deep trouble. Well, let me point out one subtlety here. And that is, I've been talking as if novel technologies just arrive. Somebody thinks them up. There's radar, etc. They arrive, and we use them. The economy changes. Structure changes. But actually, the, the deepest source of structural change is that technologies tend to arrive in clusters. So we got textile machinery in the 1770s, 1780s, on through to the Victorian period, railways and steam in between about 18, 1830 to about 1880 in Britain. Heavy engineering, this is in Germany and Britain and now in the US. Heavy chemicals, mass production in the United States, electronics, digital telecommunications, uh, we're moving into genomic technology and biotech and nanotech. And so these big waves come along as we understand novel phenomena and how to use them. These clusters of technology deeply change the economy. They go in, they're encountered by industries, and they transform those industries. The whole business of financial derivatives came out of computation more than it came out of banking. I'd say more about that in the question period, but I just want to point out that this is a subtlety that technologies sweep in in clusters, and at the end of it, the economy looks very different. 1820, the UK economy was very much like, if you remember the book, Wind in the Willows. There's canals, <laughs> Mr. Toad, and so on. By the time the railways had come in, 1850, 1860, the whole landscape looked very different. So let me finally ask here, can we reduce this to mathematics? Uh, heavens no is my initial thing, because mathematics tends to deal, at least simpler mathematics tends to deal with quantities. We're not talking about quantities. We're talking about new structures coming along. So it's better to think about this as an algorithm. What are the steps? Well, in this algorithm for how the economy forms and changes, some novel element comes along as a combination. A steam engine comes along, or the railway locomotive. That adds to the collection or substrates of Lego blocks or building blocks that you can construct from. It goes on to replace existing technologies. When the transistor comes along, it started to replace the vacuum tube. And that actually takes place over a number of years. It's by far from being instantaneous. Novel technologies form that use it. In fact, we got novel circuits and novel uh, pieces of apparatus out of uh, transistors in the 1950s and the 1960s and new organizations that contain it, that generates new needs. Uh, when transistors came along, we had a need for clean factories or fabrication plants. And then the economy readjusts. All of that sounds terribly abstract and, in a way, very boring. So what I want to do is illustrate this. And I'm close to being finished here, but I want to illustrate this with a real world example, and that is the Industrial Revolution in England from about, it starts around 1770, 1780, and goes on through, think of it right through to the period of Dickens, 1850, 1860. 
you get machines like this. This is uh, 1779, Samuel Crompton's uh, mule. It was actually a spinning machine, and it was able to spin very, very fine fiber for muslin, something that couldn't easily be done by hand. There were a number of textile machines, and I've sort of lumped them all together. How would that affect this algorithm? Well, this, these novel textile machineries are indeed combinations of spindles and wheels and pulleys and the things that they added to the substrate of elements. This began to replace um, the in-house cottage weaving. There's no question about that. Weaving by hand and spinning wheels. That's straightforward. But what I want you to notice is the next two steps. New technologies form that use it and new organizations that contain it. What happened was that these new textile machines in the 1780s and 1790s operated on a scale that was too large for one or two people to use in a cottage. To make use of those efficiently, you needed something that in those days was called a manufactory, or we would call a factory or mill. And so what already existed, existing mills were brought in, and those mills that came in needed mill workers. And the mill workers that came in to places like Manchester needed dormitories. And they needed industrial towns and so on. All of this grew organically in the sort of way Sidney Brenner was talking about yesterday. Nobody thought, we need mills, uh, we need industrial towns. All of that happened organically. That generated new needs. As I said, the moment you got uh, this very efficient textile machinery, you needed factories and mills to accommodate it. You need legions of workers. Those were the new needs. And it brought about social problems. Small children were best at using these because they could dart in and out of the machines, and they were a similar scale to, to the machines. <laughs> and uh, that led to a lot of abuse. So there was a need for further arrangements in the form of safety uh, legislation. Children were sent up chimneys. They were sent down mines. Women were sent down mines, etc. If you read Charles Dickens, I'm sure he did a lot more for working people even than Marx was to do much later. People were appalled. That, in turn, those needs brought about modern labor unions. So what I want to point out is that this algorithm is, to the degree it's correct, is not something that is um, abstract. It's a series of steps, much of which is happening in parallel. So let me finish there um, and say that this is the result. So you start off with textile machinery. A lot of those work with water power. And, and, but by and by, uh, this is actually James Watt's 1781 version of Bolton and Watt. And uh, it's combined with steam locom sorry, steam power. The whole thing gets to a scale where it produces this. And all the wretchedness and all the riches that go with this. And both went hand in hand. And then finally, society invents yet more arrangements and organizations to contain the worst of this. But it does take decades. And for me, this is real social change. I want to point out a couple of things just to go back to this algorithm again. The process I'm talking about is algorithmic, meaning that it works step by step. And I think, and this is my own opinion, as we develop complexity science, we will stop thinking quite as much in standard mathematical equations we will start to think much more in algorithms, meaning steps that lead to steps that lead to further steps. 
uh, as we do in computation. There's an overall zeitgeist that's moving us away from continuous descriptions over time. We'll always have that. But moving us to think in terms of this triggering this, that's triggering that. And these events are happening. Anything that can be well described logically, um, algorithmically, as a Turing machine can be mathematized. So that makes you uncomfortable. If you can describe it logically, you can write down the equations. <laughs> but there'd be an awful lot of zeros and ones, and the if-thens have to be taken care of mathematically. That's easy enough as well. Change in this, this is not equilibrium, then little disturbances from equilibrium. Change is ever going, and it's endogenous. All of this is happening in parallel. It's happening all the time. New things are getting combined. They're replacing old things. It's not just a gale of destruction that Schumpeter talked about. It's all of these changes going on all the time. New things coming along, creating new needs, creating new social problems, bringing yet further technologies. Will it ever cease? I don't believe so. And it's all happening in parallel. And Schumpeter said, any equilibrium, this is post Walra, post Walra visit, Schumpeter says, any equilibrium contains the seeds of its own destruction. But this isn't just the seeds of destruction of an equilibrium. There is never equilibrium here, absolutely never. It's seething with change all the time. The system is constantly creating new structures out of existing ones. I don't think I have to belabor that, but this is just simply saying that Francois Jacob was right. All of that cosmology of things getting combined flows right into the economy. The economy is no different. This is not Darwin's world of small mutations accumulating to create new things. There is plenty of that in the economy. It's combinations coming along, creating a different system that calls for new combinations, new integrations forever. And finally, I love economic history, and I like political economy. Here in NTU, there's an absolutely wonderful economics professor, David Reisman, I don't know, it's shame he's not here today, uh, who's an expert in these. But we need to get back to economic history and political economy, in my opinion, meaning looking at qualitative change and structural change. And it will gain a lot of respectability if we can bring a general logic or a general theory to it. But that theory, as I say, will be algorithmic. So let me finish. And so it's not a brilliant machine, perfectly balanced. It's more like a Barabasi system of things growing out of things. And summarize here, the argument is that the economy is basically forming all the time from its arrangements, those arrangements you can think of broadly speaking, of technologies. Those themselves form a vast chemistry, meaning starting from some simple molecules, you get more complicated molecules that form yet more complicated molecules. So technology is forming new technologies that form yet newer technologies, and the economy is constantly creating and remaking itself out of all of this and creating thereby novel problems and new needs and new challenges for which it creates yet more technologies. And that will never cease. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Brian, for this wonderful talk on uh, how the economy and technology uh, grow together and can never escape each other. So we have now time for, I'm sure, many questions. So, uh, Brian, many thanks, uh, really inspiring. Um, so the essential part is this building block notion, this notion of a building block. 
Now, let, let me make a small anal analogy with biology. Um, there's this beautiful work by a guy called Kern Smith, who actually showed that, that we had to come up with a cell at some point in time because of the fault tolerance aspects. You know, you, you will never be able to bring together the mitochondrion or, or you know, the DNA container, et cetera, if you don't have some kind of containment around it. It is very simple, called, let's say, yeah, yeah, yeah. free energy reduction me uh, mechanism that's behind that. So um, a, a good understanding of what the size of those building blocks is and what's driving the the, the concept of the building blocks itself, or what's driving, let's say, the interface of the building blocks to the outside world, seems to be like pretty fundamental to both this, this biological notion of, of building blocks and, and, let's say, the economical notion of building blocks. Now, you didn't mention, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the construction of those things, but so I want you to elaborate a bit on looking inside those building blocks, where you will find more building blocks, of course, I understand that. But looking into the concept of a building block as a, as a container that you know, maybe reduces free energy or, re or reduces um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 fault tolerance or creates fault tolerance? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a very good question. And in fact, what you call a building block is somewhat arbitrary. Um, when I was thinking about all of this and writing this book, I, I began to, I would, put your question in, in this, these terms. Why on earth are there modules in the first place? If you remember the early days of computing, <laughs> I do, <laughs> uh, we weren't very conscious that uh, we should modularize things, just lines of code and spaghetti, uh, go-to statements and things like that. But what happens is as human beings or even in nature tends to take combinations and modularize them. So there is actually an operation that goes on in uh, real life, and that is something starts as just getting thrown together. Then we begin to see it as one operation, and then we begin to actually put a, some sort of boundaries around it, and it becomes a module. A good example is uh, gene sequencing. You know, when that was first done in the 1960s and 70s, people like Sanger and others, gene sequencing was just a model of lab equipment and so on. After a while, people began to see it as a single process, not as a concatenation. It had become a module. After another while, it becomes a machine, and it sits on a lab desk somewhere. After another while, it's been greatly miniaturized, and that's already as a module to use it as part of yet another process. So we tend to have modules because that matches the way we can think about things. We don't have to think about what goes on inside them. Uh, we can design, as you saw in that little design chart I showed with pencil and paper. People tend to think in terms of modules. But we do this all the time, and we even do it in language. There, there's um, an example in language is Munich, you know, I'm a political scientist and I, I don't want to go in a big discussion that's, if somebody goes and talks to some dictator, say, in North Korea, and they come back and they give away the entire shop, that I, I don't want to have to go into half a page of discussion. I just simply say, oh, he's done a Munich. <laughs> or uh, we used to have Watergate, you know, now we have Travelgate or this gate or that gate, all as shorthand and a new module description with a new name for quite a complicated process. So nature has done this as well. Nature tends to form boundaries uh, around things like cells. Uh, part of that's protection. But, and I'm not saying nature is any great thought, but it seems to be a natural thing that boundaries form. And then things can be used programmatically, we get multicellular organization, but for that sort of thing, you need to have boundaries. Yes, I did. That's, that's, yeah, I understand this. But the question is actually, I think, what is driving this? At what moment in time does nature, or we, or anything, decides to put a boundary around it? There has to be some, some principle that drives the, the process to say, okay, now I put a boundary, now it's large enough, because if I wait longer, it will fall apart, or if I, yeah. you know, so is there any idea, you, you 
consumers. Yeah, I, I do, yeah. Uh, the moment we use anything as what I would call a functionality, we tend to put a boundary around it. I could say we have all these pieces of metal and, and, and aviation gasoline all sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier. It's easier for me to say I have an F-18 uh, jet fighter sitting there because I, the moment I have a functionality for that, that it needs to be launched and so on, then in my brain it becomes a module. And I think that's where the tendency comes from. Uh, thank you, Brian, again. You know, I have listened to you for many times and always enjoyed this. Uh, I have a question with, I'm basically, I'll clarify my confusion. I mean, I'm an equilibrium economist, you know, I'm a really a mathematician by training, but become an equilibrium economist. And my, my today's talk, it seemed to me that uh, steady state equilibrium, which is a dynamic state of equilibrium, is not at all inconsistent with this, you know, this uh, sequential uh, technology set. The problem is the knowledge set associated with the technology. Whether I knew, I knew all the things that I right now I had, I knew all the possible combinations of the things that I have, and the things that will evolve from the possible combinations, that's the accompanying knowledge set. The basic assumption of the aerodynamic economy, or you know, the Walrussian economy, is that this knowledge set is perfect. It means I know all the things that can be combined and the usefulness of this combination. The reason I didn't do it is because the cost is privately higher than the benefit of doing it. So essentially, the knowledge says is perfect. What is observed in the economy is a sequential, uh, you know, sequential, in some sense, cut and raising of events, you know? Well, point taken. Uh, yeah. The you, you can reconstruct Walrasian economics and say that we have knowledge of the existing technologies. And then we have knowledge of the combinations that will make sense out of those existing technologies. And we have knowledge of the existing technologies that might be made out of the existing technologies ad infinitum. If you had such knowledge let me speak as someone who lives and works in Silicon Valley. You'd be rich. I'd be rich. You're in a business school. <laughs> you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be. <laughs> With all due respect to MBS, uh, you and I would be rich. Yes, you can assume that, and you could re, as you say, you could redo Walrasian economics. But I'm, I'm really talking about a situation where that assumption. You can make any assumption you like. You can say, let, let all the angels dance on this one pin. That's a perfectly good assumption. But I'm talking about reality. In reality, as far as I can observe things in Silicon Valley, we can see one or two steps ahead, but not much beyond that. And we don't know what's coming next. There is no way, I was a graduate student eons ago, but there's no way I could have imagined the world we're now living in driverless cars on the freeways in California. In 15 years time, it will probably be the exception in Singapore to have to have a steering wheel and so on. Yeah, it's possible, but I think I'm continually surprised. One other thing I'd say to you, um, with great respect, because you and I have been talking for a long time, look at the number of combinations you know, what was it, 50, and you get a quadrillion possible combinations. There's nobody, not even Leon Valois, who could foresee the consequences, and we have far more basics than that. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the lecture. Yeah, as per my understanding from your lecture, the economy is becoming more complex because the number of parameters which are equivalent to technologies are becoming more and more. So. Uh, so if you see today's technology, or the, uh, sorry, today's economy and the economic in old civilization, uh, today's the, the slums are becoming more and more frequent nowadays. So is it attributed because the economy has become too complex? And I never heard of any slum concept in the old civilization, or that they, they, the slum came in this civilization, or something like that. So the question one, is it? The economic has, economy has become too complex, and if so, is there any way to make it simple? To that? Well, yeah, the, the, 
by and large, I think the economy does become more complicated and more complex, meaning we have more and more technologies. There's no question that we have vastly more technologies, again, think of medical procedures than we had in the year 1500. There's no question everywhere in the world. Uh, but that doesn't have to be true in principle. In principle, we could have Mr. Ban Banerjee over here, if I, <laughs> my good friend. We could have somebody who invented one technology that did everything. You know, it washed your clothes, it, it tucked you in at night, it drove your car, it, it was your car. So in principle, it, we could just have something that invented one technology that did everything for us as human beings. Logically speaking, we don't have to become more and more complicated. But in actuality, that's the way it's tended. And it's similar in the biosphere. You start off with a relatively small number, I presume, of archaea, bacteria, whatever you want. And it's led to a much denser and bushier family tree than before. As to slums, I don't think they're a modern invention. If you had gone back to England, I'm from Ireland. Go back to Dublin in the 1700s, it will not be much better. And you might say, well, it's worse today because so many people are better off. And then people living near them, say Mumbai or somewhere, three miles from the airport or in desperate situations. That was also true. Uh, historically, it was probably true in Rome. It was probably true in Egypt. Uh, I find that regrettable, but uh, my guess is that slums are not a modern invention, sadly. Um, <laughs> sadly for both the past and the present. Um, I had a question about scale and governance. And it kind of ties back to this first question about um, the, the functional units that you're talking about. Um, I'm interested mostly in the political and social organization kinds of technologies. Um, if you look at how much economic activity is organized, of course, it's organized in corporations which have certain frame, certain size and scale um, related to transactions costs. But if you look at these kinds of questions from a sociological perspective, um, I start thinking about Weber and the iron law, law of bureaucracy, where the functional units beca become less effective less functional over time, yet they're extraordinarily resilient and hard to get rid of. Yeah. And I'm wondering, taking all these pieces that you're talking about and putting them together, talking about the huge numbers of kinds of technologies that we're now having to deal with, whether this is just getting way beyond the limits of human cognition and whether we're building so many rigidities into the political and social organizations because of what happens to bureaucracies over time, that we're well, basically heading for a crash. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're heading for a crash. I think we already had the crash, actually, <laughs> two, or three, <laughs> two or three years ago. A couple of observations on that, and that is, uh, I didn't talk much about these large bodies of technology sweeping in. There's uh, an absolutely lovely book written by Carlota Perez called Technological Revolutions and Financial change or something. Uh, but Perez, and I like this work very much, and I was greatly inspired by it. Carlota Perez and Christopher Freeman, her mentor, they were pointing out that as these novel technology, bodies of technology come in, think of the railways, then the first thing they do is that they appear as small startup companies. Around 1830, there were tons of these little railway locomotive companies. Then they become larger, uh, very large uh, industries. Uh, they shake down and there's crashes and so on. The economy catches up and transforms itself. Society catches up and transforms itself. The last thing to transform is always the governance structure. So if someone said to me, what is the main problem of our time at the moment? And we, you and I were talking the other day about this. The main problem of our time is that we got hyper-connected via telecommunications and via digitization. Everything's now affecting everything else, roughly at the speed of light. Small, 
problems here, say in Greece, or propagating and reappearing in Germany, then in New York, all within hours or days. And we have not got the governance structures in place to take, to take care of that. Carlota Perez would say, I told you so. <laughs> and it's absolutely right, but that doesn't excuse us. I think that um, the shorthand way of putting it, and I was talking to you about this the other day. As an economist, I want to stick my neck out here. I don't think we have at the moment, economic problems that are terribly difficult. I'm talking as a European and talking as an American resident. Asia's coming up very, very fast as well. All of these supposed economic problems to do with the European Currency Union, the American meltdown, are the result not of the economy the result of institutions and regulations and governance not being properly up to date. Now, all of this happened in the past. You can tell the stories about the Roman Empire uh, or any other system that quickly uh, uh, connected the world. You have to have the governance in place. And until you do, there's a series of catastrophes and catastrophes. And then finally, it gets in place and things calm down again. But we are at that sort of a stage. And I don't know if that's one of, Jeff, you, you know, you have, your, you have your economy going up, collapse, up and collapse. But I, I do think that um, the governance institutions are not in place. And when I said arrangements, I meant institutions and legal systems as well. But they're usually the last to come into being. It's not because people who think about institutions, say, proper central banking in Europe, which doesn't really exist in spite of the European Central Bank. It's that you have to have a few catastrophes before people realize, oh my god, we need to run this thing differently. It's sad but true, uh, and I don't think maybe in Singapore, we could look far enough ahead, and people are smart enough here to see it coming. But in most of the world that I inhabit, people were not smart enough. They should have seen it 10 years ago. But I was asked 10 years ago about what I thought about the euro. I said, I'm sure it'll compete pretty well against the dollar. I didn't foresee, nor did any other economist I know of, foresee that we hadn't got the governance in place. I assumed there were smart people in Brussels who would have seen through all of that, but they didn't. I'd like to come back to this modularization. I'd like to refer to the work of a French technologist, uh, student of technology, a man called Bernard Simondon, who has made a very interesting argument about this modularization. He basically argues that a technology begins by taking components from existing technologies, much like you did, but that the next stage becomes one of closer integration between those components. Mm -hmm. And that once those components are integrated beyond a certain point, you can no longer separate them out. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, you have the module that you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I thought I was saying that with regards, say, to gene sequencing. The same could be done with a radio receiver know, around about when radio receivers began, modern ones around 1912 or so, those were all separate components on a breadboard and they were wired together. A modern radio receiver is actually just one little chip, maybe with a, a tiny loudspeaker or something like that. It's all one thing. So I agree. Uh, it goes from being separate components to something that's thought of and manufactured together, to something that completely fuses together. My analogy for that is the technology grows a bit by people discovering new combinations of Lego building blocks. And they make use of that combination for some time. And then finally, they melt down that combination <laughs> in an oven so it all fuses together so they don't have to keep doing it and it becomes a new building block. Can okay, no, I think question? it is uh, unfortunately it's time to adjourn for coffee and you might follow up with Brian on a more private basis, but before we do this, I'd like to 
offer you once again this token. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.